Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, and as John Campia calls me, your existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, Robert Meyer Burnett with a John Campia Show mailbag for Monday, May 16th. Actually, it's a day after my birthday, and I I just want to say thank you to everyone who reached out with very generous words of appreciation on my birthday. It was very nice to hear these things, and boy, did you all make me feel loved. So thank you. As you know, the John Campia Show live, when we're broadcasting, we open up the Super Chats, and you can have your questions read live on the show. But 24-7, seven days a week, you can send us a tip with a comment or a question. The link is right down below. And if we deem those questions or comments appropriate, we will read them right here on the mailbag. So... Thanks for that, and thanks for giving me something good to talk about today. Let's jump right into it. Let's see who's here. Who is here? I I, I don't know. Uh, Bat Ombre starts us off. Hello, movie family. After the big numbers from Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, and unless Ezra eats someone, we can expect decent numbers from Flash too. Is it time Superman embraced the chaos? Is it time for Mr. Mixolytic? Could a more comedic Superman work? That's an interesting question, Bad Ombre. You know, I, I think, I think one could. I think you could have a comedic take on Superman, but I don't know if people would want it. You know, I think Superman's power is that he's, you know, he's very earnest, truth, justice in the American way. I mean, I could, I could see a comedic, comedic elements. I mean, certainly Richard Donner's original 1978 Superman had a lot of humor in it. I mean, Ned Beatty. Mr. Luthor um, that wasn't a very good impression, but Mr. Tessmacher, I mean, it was funny, but I don't know if people would necessarily want a straight up Superman comedy, but again, it depends on how it was approached. I mean, it could be good, maybe. I'd definitely be interested in seeing what somebody could do. I just don't know if they would spend like $200 million on a comedic Superman movie. But it's an interesting question. Jerome sends in a tip and says, what do you think is the right and wrong way to turn a good guy into a villain? Like, for example, why did Walter White turning bad work for people while people are divided on if Daenerys turning bad was out of character and it happened too fast? Well, Jerome, I think you summed it up. I mean, the thing about Walter White was um, we watched. We watched the corruption and how at first, you know, he was trying to, make money to save his family. He thought he was dying of cancer. Um, He wanted to put something away for them. So his motivations were understood. And I think the difference with Daenerys Targaryen, at least for me, um, you're watching this woman who goes on this path and uh, it's a tightrope. Does absolute power corrupt? Absolutely. And I thought it was a really interesting, the way they had her learn how to wield power, learn how to be a leader, Um, and sometimes she did things that were abhorrent, you know, I mean, using dragons to fry people alive and things like that. But at the same time, she tried to be a good leader. And I think that her, her heel turn in the eighth season, I mean, aside from the fact that we've heard that her ancestors, her father, the mad King, whatever, went crazy and killed a bunch of people. I don't think that her story was leading us in that direction. And I think that's why it was disappointing. It always comes down to character and story. And I think if you want to show someone break bad, you have to set it up and show it happening. Um, You know, one of the, I think the finest examples is The Godfather. Obviously, Michael Corleone is supposed to be the, the good member of the family that Vito is trying to keep away from the family business, which is, well, being uh, being the head of a criminal empire. But Michael Corleone gets sucked in because of what happens to his father and he, he the need to protect his father comes in and he it turns out he's really the smartest person there. But the great tragedy of, of Michael Corleone is that he doesn't have his father's heart. He was too smart and too ruthless. And once you've done something like, well, kill your own brother, well, then you've lost your soul. And that was really interesting and it was very earned. So I think when it comes down to it, you can make any good person turn bad, but it has to work. It has to feel uh, um, 
authentic. And I think just because Daenerys Targaryen had uh, um, her cra- had craziness in her family, we saw no indication, really. I mean, she was always walking a tightrope. And the fact that she she had fought her way across Westeros and finally got into King's Landing and then just decided to kill everybody seemed, I believe, unearned to most people. It certainly did to me. So that's where I'm coming from on that one. Jerome goes on to say, in X-Men 2, Professor X almost wiped out humans and mutants with Cerebra, which makes me think if he could do that, he could also brainwash every human and mutant to stop hating each other. So why do you think he never considered doing that? Well, I think because uh, Professor Xavier is, Xavier is a moral man. And, you know, one of my favorite movies is A Clockwork Orange, Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. And in that movie, uh, in order to get rid of criminality, they create a process where they shape and mold your behavior. They modify your behavior by using movies and drugs to uh, condition you against having violent thoughts. The problem is, and what's so monstrous, and what I love about the movie, though, is it says, ultimately, the message of the film is, it is better to have free will, even if someone chooses to do evil. For human beings, it is better to have free will. And you, I, I think we would all believe, or I think that it's better off if human beings have that choice. You have to make that moral choice. You have to choose good. To have it forced upon you isn't truly freeing. And we have the power to choose to do do good and to be moral beings. And Xavier, if he were to do that, there wouldn't be genuine goodness. He would have forced something upon humanity and that is that is uh, not not good. At least that's the way I see it. Jerome goes on to say, do you think in Avengers Infinity War, Doctor Strange foresaw the emergence of the Eternals and that letting the snap happen would postpone it? And on a side note, couldn't they have just cut off Thanos' hand unless Strange knew they would lose if they tried? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think I think that Doctor Strange, he saw you know millions of potential outcomes, but I don't think he saw every outcome. I think because it wasn't a whole lot of time, he just saw the results of various things that happened with Thanos. I don't think that he foresaw the emergence. I really don't. I think he had to allow events to unfold the way they unfolded to get to the desired outcome. I think so. Great questions, Jerome. Jade Osma, uh, uh, Jay Osma, I think Osma, like Osma Vod, Oz. Jade Osma Ashwood sends in a tip and says, has there been any new news on the Waterworld show? Deadline reported that the follow-up series would pick up with the film's characters 20 years later, and there was rumors of a deal with Peacock. Have you heard anything since, Jade? I'm a Waterworld fan. I have heard nothing like Colonel Clink. <coughs> nothing. Or not Colonel Clink, that was the other guy, Schultz. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So I don't, I don't know. I have not heard anything. Um, 1.21 at Jelly Watts sends in a tip and says, if we dream of our multiverse selves, then I feel horrible for the other 1.21 Jelly Watts out there. Many are being chased by crazy creatures, falling forever, or trapped in a bed, unable to move. A couple are getting pretty lucky, though. One can even fly. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm not going to lie. Uh, I like this idea that you dream of your multiverse self because my multiverse self gets up into gets up into some great shenanigans that I wish my life was was so interesting. Of course, like you said, there are others that get up to like falling forever. Um, it was an interesting uh, an interesting uh, uh, premise that they had there. Um, I like that idea, and yeah, it's, it puts a whole new spin on your dreams, doesn't it? And and all the dreams you've had throughout your life. Maybe it's, I don't know if it would be such a good thing. <clears throat> uh, Victor Movie Fan sends in a tip and says, Hi, crew. May 14th, 1948 is the anniversary of the rebirth of the nation of Israel. A movie I love to watch is Defiance. Have you seen it? And your thoughts on the film? Is that the Daniel Craig movie, um, you know, about resistance fighters? Look, as a Jew myself, I am a, I am a, a fierce Zionist. Um, I believe in the existence of Israel. 
we are uh, the Jews. There's less than 20 million Jews, I think, left on earth, probably a lot less than that. And um, I think that the Jewish state is important. And the founding of Israel was a big deal. And remember, what people forget is after the United Nations and after after Israel was founded, it spent the next 20 years basically fending off invasions. Everybody tried to destroy Israel. And the situation that we find ourselves in today, they would still try and destroy Israel. So I, I think it's there are, there are plenty of places where all the religions of the world have their seats of power. And the Jews have one small plot of land uh, that some people could make the case that, you know, it's, it's, it's ancestrally where they're supposed to be. Um, you know, Michael uh, Shaban, the, the, the writer, Shaban, Michael Shaban, wrote uh, an interesting um, book called The Secret Policeman's Other Ball, I believe. Was it that? I'm not sure. I forget what it's called, but it's about a, a, a Israel sort of relocated to a different place. But um, I think that might have been a Monty Python thing I'm thinking about. But yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. I loved Defiance. I love World War II resistance movies, no matter who they're about. Whether it's the French Resistance, I loved Brian Singer's Valkyrie, which was about a plot inside the uh, German army to to depose Hitler. It doesn't go well, but Tom Cruise played von Stauffenberg, and I'm I'm a I'm a fan of those things. So yeah, Defiance. If that's the right one, if that's I, I could be thinking of another Defiance, but I think you're thinking of the Daniel Craig version. Cody Stevens sends in a tip and says, what do you think about the upcoming One Piece live action TV show and animated movie? <sighs> I think that it's really difficult to translate anime. I know people say anime, but the actual Japanese pronunciation that I've always heard is ah, anime. Uh, and and so I always say anime, even though people go, Rob, you're not saying it right. But... Um, that very well could be, but I, you know, I looked it up. How do you pronounce anime? We say because it's animation, but in Japan would be like anime. Um, it's really hard because there's a lot of obviously, if something is created in in Asia, they have different. There, it's a different culture, and I think one of the things that makes animation <clears throat> and manga so attractive is that it does have a different flavor than if it came from the West. And what happens is they try and westernize these things. And One Piece, I mean, how how many episodes? Like, it's gone on for, there's like a thousand, it's not like a thousand episodes or something. I mean, I don't know how they're going to do it. So, I, look, I always, hope springs eternal. I always go into live action animation. I, look, my favorite, just so we're all on the same page, I think the Wachowski Speed Racer is amazing. I love it. Um, I thought it was a great translation of the original comic, uh, the original manga, and the TV show. So that's that's where my baseline is. But everything that I've ever seen translated, uh, most of it doesn't pass pass the smell test. They try and make it too Western. They try and change things too much, and I don't I don't like that. I mean, one of the reasons I like like Evangelion is because it is so weird, and so Eastern. And I look for One Piece. I want it. They're doing it. I want it to be good. I always want it to be good. Great characters. Great story. And I want. I wanted to honor the original source material, but we shall see. Uh, Bames John, Bames John said, "Hey guys, great show today." So I was initially on a Sam Neill movie binge, <laughs> which then led me to the movie Possession, directed by Andre Zulewski. So many emotions watching that movie. Uh, any of you seen Zuleski movies and did you like them? Oh, I have. I own multiple copies of Possession. For those of you who might not have ever heard of Possession, uh, it is a 1981 movie made by the Polish director, uh, Andrzej Zuleski. He also made um, uh, an unfinished science fiction movie. I forget what it's called, The Golden Spheres or something, that <laughs> the government took away from him when he was making it. Um, but Possession is a 1981 horror film that stars Sam Neill and Isabella Gianni. And uh, in in the movie is a, a very harrowing account of a breakup between a couple. But something's going on with the wife that we don't really know. And <clears throat> the less you know about the movie, the better. It is, it is it, in my mind, one of my 
It's one of my more favorite horror films, and it certainly is not for everybody. But and if you if you go in cold, I promise you, you'll have a good time. But that's all I'm going to say about it. I'm a big fan of his. He's made some really interesting. He made a great movie about the devil. I'm trying to think what the name of that is, but um, very interesting filmmaker, very interesting voice. I highly recommend checking him out. But Bames John, uh, I appreciate that you dug it. Rob's Blu-ray collection. <laughs> well, it's everywhere. I mean, I've got... <coughs> it's everywhere. Rob's Blu-ray collection says, My son was born in 2003. Every movie I have taken him to see, I saved every ticket and wrote which friends was with him. I recently built a wooden box shaped like a movie ticket... So he will always have those memories to look back on. Dude, what a wonderful idea. I used to save all my movie tickets, and then it got to the point where I think my mom might have thrown them out. Like, why why do you have these? But um, I love the idea that you built a wooden box that looks like a movie theater ticket. Because that's what I should have done. If you had a place to put them all, I mean, imagine um, eventually he would have, I don't know, however many movie tickets. You could make a collage or something and put them all on the wall, but... What a great idea. Well done, sir. I uh, I wholeheartedly approve. Scott Brown sends in a tip and says, It just occurred to me that between your spoiler talk and mailbag, I've spent like 50 bucks complaining about a movie I didn't like in Doctor Strange 2. But I love the show, so that's okay. That being said, I have more thoughts after the spoiler window is up. Well, Scott Brown, first of all, uh, we very much appreciate you supporting the channel in that way. Thank you so much. Uh, it means a lot to us, obviously, here. And, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, look, I love what, I love hearing what people what people have to say. And uh, we do appreciate the fact that you support the channel in that way. But I think it's a, I think it's a great way to interact. I, I can never get enough of what our viewers think. And um, I love hearing what people think about movies, too. So it's, it's a, I think it's a win-win for all of us, um, which is great. And we look forward to hearing more of your thoughts, certainly. Luke, I am your plumber, sends in a tip and says, Rest in peace, Fred Ward. I was first introduced to him in the movie Uncommon Valor. I love Uncommon Valor. For those of you who don't know, I want to say, did Ted Kotcheff direct Uncommon Valor? The director of First Blood, the original First Blood. Uh, And and it's a story where um, Gene Hackman goes with a bunch of, a group of, commandos to rescue prisoners of war in Vietnam that are still there. Uh, I was first introduced to him in the movie Uncommon Valor, also with Fred Ward and Gene Hackman and Tex Randall Tex Cobb. But I'll never forget when Ford, uh, when Fred ordered and ate the raw hamburger in that movie. Also, have you ever seen it? And what did you think? Well, you know, Luke, there was a lot of movies, Rambo, First Blood Part Two being one of them, where there was this notion that there were prisoners of war that were still being kept in Vietnam that the government knew about them and and nobody would go in or or risk going in to get them out so Uncommon Valor was one of those movies I thought it kicked ass I saw that movie in the theater I loved it Um, and of course you love the idea that we're going in to rescue American troops what's not to like you know Fred Ward was an amazing he he was an amazing actor he was in movies like Miami Blues that I loved he played Virgil Gus Grissom in The Right Stuff, which I loved. He was in a teen comedy that's one of my favorite teen comedies of the 80s. He played one of the fathers in a movie called Secret Admirer. Uh, He's great. And, of course, Tremors. Um, I always thought that he would have made a great Wolverine because he wasn't very tall. And he had a – I thought he had a Wolverine look to his face. Um, But that wasn't meant to be. Uh, He will be missed. I think he was 78 when he passed away. But he's a great, great actor. Nathan, one of three. Hey, John and Rob, while it's still unknown who is going to be playing the Fantastic Four when they come to the MCU, I would personally love to see David Tennant and Rosamund Pike, Rosamund, Rosamund Pike play Reed Richards and Sue Storm, respectively. Uh, there, would be, there are many reasons why neither of them would be likely to take their respective roles, but it would be amazing if some unforeseen set of circumstances, they actually did get cast. Nothing is truly official until we hear it from Kevin Feige, and I just wanted to share my thoughts before it is too late. I love that casting. I love both both Rosamund Pike, and I, I love David Tennant. 
you know, I see I see David Tennant's pretty slender. I always saw Reed Richards as being more of a presence physically. But you know what? Doesn't matter. David Tennant, if you've ever seen Broadchurch, he's great in that. I think I like that casting. I don't know if that would ever happen, but it's pretty good casting. I, I kind of dig it. I kind of dig it. Hey guys, we want to take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, Athletic Greens. Now, when you get really busy, and you guys know that Ann and I are really busy, one of the first things you sacrifice is eating healthy. And you know, I simply have never eaten enough vegetables in my diet, I admit it. So for a long time, I've been looking for a really good all-in-one supplement that helps me get those nutrients and vitamins that my body needs. And thank goodness, I found Athletic Greens AG1. So what is Athletic Greens AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, and probiotics to help you start your day right. And for me and Ann, it's easy. We get up in the morning, we pour a big glass of water, and add one scoop of AG1. So many people today are taking some kind of multivitamin, and it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. And it's cheaper than getting all those different supplements yourself. And on top of giving you all those vitamins and nutrients, it also supports better sleep and quality of recovery, and supports mental clarity and alertness. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash mailbag. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash mailbag to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Jerome's back. Jerome says, why do you think fans feel they know who a character is better than the people who write for or created the character? For example, how they reacted to decisions by characters like Luke in The Last Jedi, Superman in Man of Steel, or Daenerys in Game of Thrones. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think it's a different experience when you are a creator as opposed to being a viewer or a fan. Because think about it this way. When you're watching a movie or you're watching a TV series, you're immersed in the world and the story that they're telling you. So you're seeing it from that perspective, being immersed in a story. But when you're a creator trying to tell a story, there are all these things in your head where you're trying to make sure that you've got a, a, a great and compelling story that works as a story that doesn't necessarily take into account the world and everything that's going on in that realm. Like for instance, okay, um, in Last Jedi, I think the idea of a character, you could say, you know what would be interesting? Like if you're in a meeting with somebody and you're trying to figure out what are we going to, what are we going to make Star Wars episode eight about? And you think, well, what if, you know, what if Luke was disgraced? And what if Luke, you know, went into personal exile because he made a mistake and he has to have some kind of redemption, even though he, he, he doesn't want to. And he's sort of dragged out from a storytelling standpoint, that can be really compelling. And if you go down that road and and you're like, okay, that's that's really great, and you could come up with a great story, like uh, uh, you know, I think about the Clint Eastwood western Unforgiven, you know, about a, a very bad man who tried to go on the straight and narrow, and then he finds himself having to go back to his old ways. Um, the problem is, the problem is, from a storytelling standpoint, doing that to Luke sounds good on paper, and you can go down that road. You think you've got a great story. The question is, do the people that are steeped in Star Wars lore that have the experience of Star Wars as the movies and the comics and the books and the video games and the, now the TV episodes, if the people that are steeped in Star Wars lore, and there's of course a lot of them, I am one of them, they don't want to see Luke do that. Because why would you want to? Luke is a cornerstone foundational character of the Star Wars universe. You want to see him be a kick-ass Jedi. Now... If it wasn't Star Wars, if it was something else, then maybe it would work. But we haven't seen Luke as a kick-ass, powerful Jedi yet. In the prequel trilogy, basically at the end of, at the end, well, I mean, at the sequel trilogy, at the end of Return of the Jedi, Luke is now a fully formed Jedi Knight. He confronted Vader. He did not succumb to the Emperor. 
And now he is a Jedi, bringing the Jedi back into existence. But not in the sequel trilogy. We see him as he's disgraced. So at the end of Return of the Jedi, you're, Luke is there. He's, his journey is complete. He's now a Jedi. The Jedi Yoda wanted him to be. The Jedi Ben Kenobi wanted him to be. And then when you see him in at the end of Force Awakens and then, of course, in The Last Jedi, he's not that. And I think that Star Wars fans felt robbed. I, I certainly know that I did. While I tried to find the good in the story, and I do think it's pretty baller when Luke comes back and confronts Kylo Ren, you know, and he's not even really there. I thought that was a pretty great Jedi move. But he's such a sad sack, and when you see him, it's not, it is very unsatisfying to see Luke that way because we've never seen him be a kick ass Jedi. I mean, a full fledged kick ass Jedi where, you know, he can wreck shop. And that's why when he comes back in, say, The Mandalorian, it was so much fun to see him just come on in and save the day and take Grogu out with him. And it was awesome because that's all Star Wars fans wanted. I mean, it's one thing I understand as storytellers, you're like, we're going to do something new and different. We're going to give the audience something that, that, you know, they might not be expecting. We'll subvert their expectations. That's fine. And I don't necessarily have a problem with subverting expectations, but... Uh, You can't subvert expectations before uh, you've given an audience what they really, really want to see, which is Luke at the height of his powers coming back and taking care of business. At least the way I, that's the way I think so. Boris says, Hey Rob, I'm sad you didn't like strange new worlds. I really thought it might get you when you said Anson Mount for Reed Richards. I was like, damn, I want that now. You two also look strikingly alike when you smirk. Ha ha ha. You guys killed it on Friday too. Well, Boris, first of all, thank you. Look, here's the thing about Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Anson Mount is a is, is a star. And the reason they even made that show was because he he was the only person on Star Trek Discovery who acted like they were a real Starfleet officer. He has that kind of charisma. So I understand it. But I'll tell you something. What uh the show to me is a confection. It feels like I'm watching a Star Trek cover band and there's things in it. I know there's only been two episodes, but like the beginning of the the second episode, we open in, I guess, uh, Pike's cabin and they're having dinner and it's all the principal cast of the show. But the problem is the principal cast of the show would not be the people that Pike fraternizes with normally. Usually he would be hanging out with his command staff, but he's having dinner with Cadet Uhura, which is fine, but... Did you ever see Kirk hang out with like Sulu and Chekhov in his cabin? He didn't because there's a command structure you follow. And I understand the, the problem that I have with, with, with new Star Trek is they dispense with so much of what the show actually is. The Enterprise and, and Starfleet is a quasi-military organization. So they would follow rules of discipline and things like that. And like, I would be interested to see Pike say if there's four different cadets on the Enterprise having a dinner with these four cadets and having a conversation about what he expects of them and what they are expecting and hoping their time on the Enterprise could be. And we could get some real character insight into all of them. But because we have our principal characters, when they do a scene like that to me, I'm like, this would never happen this way on this ship and they do that all the time and you know when uhura uses the word cool it sounds out of place what is the 23rd century equivalent of cool and all that is world building like she can say cool but what would a communications officer who speaks all these languages what would she use instead of the word cool I mean, you could either make up a word like Battlestar Galactica had their expression frack or something. When she says cool, to me, I just hear bad writing. And I know it doesn't matter to some people, but when I'm watching an episode of Strange New Worlds, to me, it's one not thought through decision after another. For instance, in the first episode, Captain Pike takes a shuttlecraft up from Earth. And when the shuttlecraft is right next to the Enterprise... He beams off the shuttlecraft and onto the Enterprise. He doesn't land with the shuttlecraft. He beams off. Now, the reason they created the transporter in Star Trek in the first place was they needed a cost-effective way of getting the crew from the ship down to the planets for episodes. 
and they had a shuttlecraft, but that would have been too cost prohibitive. They have to have different effect shots. They had to have some way that, that they would justify that. So the transporter was an easy way around that. So I'm watching this and I'm thinking, okay, so Pike has, has taken a shuttlecraft instead of just beaming directly up to the ship. And I'm thinking, okay, there's a reason for that because he's coming back and there's a little pomp and circumstance. He's going to land in the hangar deck. He's going to meet his crew. It would be an interesting way that we would be introduced to our new characters in a formal situation. But oh no, he takes the shuttlecraft up and is beamed off the shuttlecraft. I- I'm like, why would you do that? It's one or another, one, one, one or the other. And it just, it makes no sense to me. And I'm watching this going, not because... Oh, it's what they did on the old show. It, it's like you if you have a transport, beam right up to the ship. Why get on a shuttlecraft and fly right up next to the Enterprise and then have somebody beam you off the shuttlecraft? In my mind, I'm like, nobody would do that. Like if I was reading scripts, if I was a story analyst working on Star Trek, that's what I used to be. I was a story analyst for a number of years where I read screenplays for a living and wrote notes about them and recommended them. I worked for production companies and talent agencies. And these are the kind of notes you would give. You're like, come on, why would you why would you do this? So when I see it, it drives me crazy. But you know, hey, it might get better. I mean, I I do enjoy it. I don't hate it, but to me it feels again, the writing is always letting me down. Mike G says, Love to the Campia family. Hope John's mom is on the mend. Moms are superheroes, and my heart goes out to John right now for putting her first and doing what he had to do to be with her while she's not well. Props to the crew for holding it down in L.A. Uh, Mike, that's very nice of you to say. You know, John's close with his family. They mean a great deal to him. He's always talking about them, as you know. He talks about them on the show. So here's hoping for a speedy recovery for Mrs. Campia. And uh, I've never met her, but um, I would love to meet her uh, someday. But thank you for that. It's very, very nice of you to say. Jerome comes back and says... Think Disney could replace Smith's genie with the ring genie, who is a character of the original story and other adaptations of Aladdin and keep Smith's genie off screen with his family shown in the first movie? Maybe. I think it's not a bad idea. But, you know, when a, when a franchise is so recognized, I mean, I think everybody was dubious as to whether the live action Aladdin could work, much less could it work with Will Smith. And I think it worked like gangbusters. And I think they would want to definitely have him come back. Um, I don't know if they will, uh, but I think, look, everyone loves a comeback story, and Will Smith is a very liked actor and a performer, and I, frankly, I would like to see his career come back. I don't want his career to be ended over this, but that's not a bad way. I mean, that's not a bad way to to bring a genie back. Um, That'd be kind of interesting. Again, it would would have to be the actor, whoever they're going to, pull in to replace him i mean that kind of could be interesting if they made multiple aladdin sequels and you had different people play a genie in each movie that's a way that they could go it depends i mean how they would work that out but um it could work dirt on my boot says one or two i still haven't seen everything everywhere i want to mainly from hearing you guys talk about it but jamie lee curtis keeps posting on instagram about doctor strange being an inferior multiverse movie and bashing on marvel I get her opinion, but it seems a bit unprofessional for an actor to continuously bash on another movie while simultaneously saying artists support artists. It's almost like she forgot Michelle Yeoh is in a major Marvel movie. Either way, it's made me less a fan of Curtis. Well, dirt on my boot, all uh, very salient points you are making there, but I would say this, you know, uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once is a small, low-budget indie film. And I think that Jamie Lee Curtis um, is probably, um, she's just out there trying to get people to see their little movie. It's doing well, but it's not doing half a billion dollars well, obviously, on its way to maybe making a billion dollars. So I think rather than be upset with her, because I love Jamie Lee Curtis, I think I would look at her, I mean, uh, you know, She knows that Marvel doesn't need any help, that they're making plenty of of money. And I think in a way, she's probably got her tongue in cheek a little bit, a little bit. And I haven't looked at her Instagram, so you might be right. In which case, that's not that's not cool. But I think she's just she's just out there supporting the work that she's done with her talented cast and crew and um, her directors. And I think that's that's what she's doing. But again, I don't know. But you might be right. 
But I love the fact that you keep bringing back the name Dirt on My Boot. Uh, that's very funny. Donald R. says, Seeing Harloff on the show last week gave me great old AMC Collider vibes, seeing you, Rob, and him together. But it got me thinking, why is it only you who continues to succeed in this area? Why didn't any of the other crew make it or places like Screen Junkies or others who tried to do the movie news thing? What would you say set you apart? Well, Donald, I, I, I can answer that. I think, I think I can answer that. John, of all the people that I've met that are working in the YouTube space, I think John's uh, consistency, the fact that, that he really works hard, he does his homework, he puts on a, a very professional show. He has subjects. He attacks and addresses those subjects directly. He does research. He he makes the show. It's not simply an op-ed show. It's an actual, you're getting news. You're getting real news. And then we opine on that news. And I just think the way that John does it is extremely professional. I've got my own YouTube channel, of course, the Post Geek Singularity, and, and my my, um, I'm about to pass 50,000, getting close to 50,000 subscribers, but mine's a different show. My, my show is very loosey goosey. And I've often thought if I emulated what John does more, maybe I could build my own channel up. But then I realized I don't want to do that. I like doing what I do on my own channel because I'm on John's channel. And I do think that John provides the best movie, uh, entertainment show on the internet. And I'm very fortunate enough to be there. You know, a lot of people disagree with me. A lot of people disagree with John. But I think that's why people tune in. They know that they're getting a really quality show. And that's not to say other people haven't provided a good quality show. Like somebody that I greatly respect is someone like Dan Merle. I watched Dan Merle's channel. I got to know him. Not well, but I got to know him doing the Schmodown. And I have all the respect in the world for Dan. He's really smart. He really knows his stuff. And I think he does a good job as well. And I think it comes to quality and consistency and um, also sincerity. You know, that's another thing. In addition to the technical prowess that John brings to the show, we're genuine. You know, people might say that we're Marvel shills. We are not. We just, what we like, we like. And we talk about what we like and, and there is no I mean, we might have wrong takes or hot takes or you might hate something that we say, but at least you know it's coming from, we're not making shit up, <laughs> you know? I mean, we all, that's that's not true. We, we do make up stuff all the time off the top of our heads, but for the most part, I think everybody can sense that where we're coming from is very genuine and what you see is what you get. And I, I think that John has a, a really good nose for talent and I think Aaron, Chris, Ray, myself, and John put on a good show at least. That's what I like to think. And I, I think Christian does too, you know. Uh, Spud Queen, one of two, says, Fellas, help a girl out. I am luckily in the position to start my Hot Toys addiction. Be careful. I'm just going to say be careful. And I'm deciding between Season 7 Clone Wars or Season 2 Mandalorian Ahsoka Tano. The Season 2 Mando figure comes with a tiny Grogu, both of these figures are gorgeous in their own, Spud Queen goes on to say, right, and have potential hot toy companions. But my gut reaction is to choose the Season 7 Clone Wars figure, but it feels impossible to choose. Which would you choose? Rob, do you have either of these figures? I have not got Ahsoka yet, but I will. I definitely will get Ahsoka. Um, you know, it's tough. I, I, I always advise people, like, this is a tough choice. My... Guiding philosophy has always been to usually buy uh, w w one figure of a character, the best version of that figure. So getting two Ahsokas, I mean, if you love Ahsoka, get them both. But one is obviously from the Clone Wars and one is from the live action Mando. So if you're going to get other Mando figures, um, you can display them with those figures. But if you're going to get like, they also just put out a beautiful Anakin, a Clone Wars Anakin Skywalker. Now it's a great figure. You can either get the deluxe version with the stap that he comes with, that he flies on, or you can get the figure just by itself. Having that Anakin figure and Ahsoka on a shelf together, both of the Clone Wars figures, that's a great display. But then again, 
getting the live action Ahsoka and handing uh, and uh, having her to display with other Mando figures is also great. So I would say, what would you rather go after? Which characters are you going after that you'd want to display the Ahsokas with? Would you go for the Clone War Clone Wars figures, or would you go for more Mando figures? And maybe that'll guide you, if that makes sense. Good question, though. Send me a picture. I want to see what it looks like when you make that display. William Bangs sends in a tip and says, John, I miffed it, Feige. I shouldn't have to subscribe to Disney Plus just to view a Doctor Strange movie. Film and TV are completely different, and I can only afford to stream so much. Also, hundreds of worlds is too much. Three will do, like in No Way Home. Thanks. Hey, look, you know what? I think um, they didn't do enough multiverse stuff. We only got a few multiverse uh, worlds. I would like to have seen a lot more, to be honest. But you know, I, I, I. Are, are you saying that you didn't go out to the theater to see Doctor Strange? You, you don't want to subscribe to Disney Plus? I mean, look, what I like about Disney Plus is you're going to have at some point almost the entire output of Disney's whatever they've done, animation, live action, documentaries. It's all going to wind up there, and um, I think it's kind of cool to have that legacy. I'm a big fan of Disney Plus. I think they do a great job. Um, I'm, I am miffed at them that they've made the IMAX enhanced versions of the MCU movies only available on Disney Plus. Damn it. That pisses me off. But I do like Disney Plus for doing it. So I think it's definitely well worth the money. But that's up to you. Um, see, for me, I go see movies in the theater and I have Disney Plus. Um, at maybe at some point, I'm going to have to figure out cut my finances down, not spend so much money, cut down on the streaming services. Uh, this comes from Ethan Holgate, one of four. Hi, John or Rob. Everything Everywhere All at Once finally got released in Ireland and the UK, and I went to see it today, and my God, that has to be by far one of the most batshit, insane, crazy as fuck movies I've ever seen in my life. Like, holy shit. <laughs> Talk about doing a family drama storyline and mix it in with a wild multiverse sci-fi concept. Do a line of cocaine and boom, you have this movie. Laugh out loud. I can totally see why this is your favorite film of the year. It's definitely going in my top five favorites of the year. For me, no doubt. I absolutely loved every second of this movie's terrific performances by the whole cast, especially from short round. Data himself, K. Hu Kwan. Not going to lie, it brought joy to my heart seeing him all grown up and in a movie again. He hasn't lost his charm, and he still has it all of these years later, in my opinion. Also, do you know if Rob has seen it yet? I think he would love it. Also, do you know if he's seen Michael Bay's new film, Ambulance, yet out of curiosity? Well, first of all, I have seen it. I feel the way you did. Um, it was, it, first of all, it, it's so original, and it goes about telling its story in such an original way fun way, which it shouldn't surprise me because the director's previous movie, uh, the directors, they made a movie, it's two directors, they made Swiss Army Man with Daniel Radcliffe, Harry Potter himself, playing a dead guy, the whole movie, kind of like a, a new weekend at Bernie's. When I saw that, I'm like, these guys are nuts. These filmmakers are nuts. But everything everywhere is so clever and it's so interesting. It's so much fun to watch, like you said. It's a family drama. It's a science fiction multiverse drama. It's comedic. It takes you on a on a wide variety, a wide range of emotions. It's a really, really delightful, creative movie, and um, yeah, I I I just loved it, and I think it 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 was tremendous. And everything you had to say about it is absolutely true. And you know, it really is. When was the last time you went to the movies and felt that way? Saw something that was totally surprising. I mean, even if you see the trailer, it doesn't really convey what it's like to see the movie itself. And and how great was it when it was over? How big was the smile on your face? You're just like shaking your head with delight. And I'm sure the audience that you saw it with was too. And how often does that happen these days? Not very. And I think everything everywhere is, it reminded me of like, even though they, they're nothing like one another. I remember when I saw Terminator in the theater for the first time. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger had been Conan, and it was a science fiction movie, and James Cameron, he'd been an effects guy, and I, I hadn't seen Piranha 2, The Spawning. But when I when I walked out of Terminator, I was like, that movie kicked ass! Who is James Cameron, and what's he going to do again? 
And it was kind of like that. I mean, it was nothing like Terminator, but when you walked out of everything everywhere, you're like, that was incredible because it was something you hadn't seen before. It's what cinema does best. And uh, boy, did I have a lot of fun, just like you did. Great comments. And uh, thanks, Ethan. Thanks for the support. Well, that'll do it for this episode of The Mailbag. Uh, my name is Robert Meyer Burnett. You can follow me on Twitter at Burnett RM. Find me on Instagram at RM Burnett. Or find me on my own YouTube page, The Post Geek Singularity. Or you can go to postgeeksingularity.com for our cool website. There's all kinds of news and information on the website. So check it out. Now, I'm going to announce something here at the end of this mailbag for those of you who um, who, are, who who have gone this far. I have COVID. I, I, I've been able to avoid it for two years, but um, Elizabeth, uh, my girlfriend, we lived together. Her oldest daughter went to a wedding in North Carolina and brought it back. And I thought I would be able to avoid it. I have been vaxxed and boosted, but everybody in the house got it. The other, Elizabeth got it, I got it. So I have to quarantine for a couple days and I can still do mailbags, but I don't know if I'll be on the John Campy show this week, which really bums me out. I mean, Chris Carr was hosting today and I wanted to be there. I wanted to see her host. I think she'll probably, she probably did a great job. I haven't watched the show today. I'll bet she killed it. Anyway, kids, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gentle folks, kind souls, however you identify across these, the 28 known galaxies, I want to thank you for watching this edition of the John Campion Mailbag. And once again, in the link down below, you can send us a question 24-7 seven days a week, and we will get back to you. And on that note, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. Thanks for watching.